Yeah, it's your boy Chill here. Welcome back to C++ Multi-Threading. In the last video, we upgraded our thread pool slash task queue to make it compatible with STID Future. I ended that video with a bit of a threat that we are going to look at the implications of asynchronous operations in our task queue. But before we jump in, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. So our generate data sets function here, it's a little scuffed because we don't do like chunks anymore. We don't have them separated into chunks and each worker gets its own chunk. So we gotta like fix this stuff here. In the constants here, let's like remove a bunch of parameters that just don't make any sense, like chunk count and chunk size. What I actually wanna do is I wanna make this stuff configurable from the CLI, because I don't wanna recompile every time I make a little change to an, a parameter. And I mean, while we're at it, let's just clean up the detritus here. Like we're not using this stuff anymore. We're, we're now living our task queue life. All right, housekeeping is done. We are now getting in our parameters from the command line at runtime and our tasks, our data sets that we're generating. It's no longer an array, a vector of arrays. It's now just a vector of tasks, much simpler. Now I want to quickly review the case for a compute based task. So let's replace this with the compute heavy workload like we had a little earlier. So as before, we're going to generate our random data set. The task is just to call process. We're using ranges to submit those to our thread pool. So we have the data set, which is just a vector of tasks, and we're gonna transform each task by running it on the pool. That gives us a future. We're gonna turn that into another vector of futures. And then we loop over all those futures and we block on them so we can wait until all the tasks have completed. I pulled in chili timer here and I start timing as I'm submitting the futures or submitting the tasks to the thread pool and I stop the timing when we have completed all our futures. And there you have it. So this shouldn't be too complicated. So we can maybe tune that a little bit if I set the data set size to 10,000. Yeah, it takes about as long as you would expect. If I increase the light and heavy iterations by 10x. Yeah, we 10x the time taken. So by default, we're using four workers here. Um, we could increase that. We do it to eight workers. It should take about one second to complete. It does take Pretty much one second. Double number of workers, you have the time. Uh, if we go to 16, we might start to see diminishing returns. Yeah, it didn't quite go to half, but it's still pretty good improvement. Now, if we go to 32, I'm just gonna tell you right now, this machine has eight physical cores, so it has 16 logical cores. And so if you increase the worker count to 32, you shouldn't see much of an improvement. Now we do see that it goes a little faster. Like typically when your CPU is running, you've got a few threads that are working. Mostly the cores are just idling. Now when you throw a big workload at it, like let's say you throw 16 threads that are all working like full out. See the yellow here is the workload of our program with uh, 16 worker threads. It's gonna take up the majority of the system's time, but there's still a little bit of work that's being allocated to all the other threads that are normally just on the system, right? For example, in my case here, I've got OBS running recording while I'm doing this. Now what happens is if you double the number of your worker threads, it's gonna squeeze down the amount of time that it spends on the, all the other threads on the system down even more proportionally to how many worker threads are in your big hog application. So, you can get a little bit faster if you double or triple or quadruple the number of logical cores on your system, but that comes at a cost, right? Because that is gonna give you a lot less time to run all the background stuff that keeps your system responsive and like just working. So if you, if I were to throw this worker count at like, let's just put it at like 128 and let's make the, the data set size bigger so that it takes a longer time to run and see what it does. I'm, I'm interested to see when I edit this, does OBS, like, does it start dropping frames like crazy or something? Um, so let's just try this. Let's triple that. I wanna get a good time in here. And what you're gonna notice here is this like starting diagnostics tools thing. It doesn't move because <laughs> the CPU can't even do the stuff that Visual Studio wants it to do. So normally if you do this, but you turn the worker count down to like 16, well, let's turn down to 14. Let's give the system plenty of breathing room. What you're gonna see here is Visual Studio is able to draw all these graphs and stuff because I'm, I haven't completely brought the system to its knees. But if I bring that back up to 128, like everything hangs. 
this this does not work anymore because I, there's no there's no resources left on the system. I'm hogging everything. So that's typically not what you want. This is called oversubscription. We don't have that many. We don't have 128 cores. So when we do this, we are flooding out everything in the system. And this is a concept you guys should be familiar with at this point. You want to set your worker count to be around the number of logical processors you have on your system. Maybe a few less, maybe a few more, but generally in that ballpark is the sweet spot. You're not going to get, you're only going to get a tiny bit of more performance if you overload the system, if you oversubscribe. And the trade-off for getting that tiny improvement in your runtime is that you just totally destroy the system. Not worth it in my opinion. But now let's switch it up. Let's change the paradigm here. So we're going to make another task. We're going to call this one async task. Now an async workload is a workload that is waiting for some work to be done outside of the CPU. So this is typically network stuff, you know, TCP, IP sockets. You're waiting for a response from a remote server. It could also be file input output, because that can take some time. And even stuff like uh, general purpose GPU, you know, you submit some compute to the GPU and the CPU is just waiting for that to be done. And the idea here is that there is some operation, it takes time, but during that time our CPU is idling. So that time isn't really consuming the resources of the CPU, the logical processors. So we're going to simulate that because it's going to be complicated to start to bring sockets into this, although I might, I might look at that in the future. I got an idea for that. But we're going to make a very simple task here. It's going to sleep for a number of milliseconds. Now we'll do this right and we're going to put that in our constants here. So we'll call it async sleep and then in here we can sleep for one millisecond times async. So this is our async task. Now how do things look when we have a completely asynchronous workload? So we're going to do something a little, a little funny here. We're going to transform our tasks, but we're actually going to ignore the work items and just queue up an async task for every one of those. All right, so I set the data set size to 160, the worker count to 16, so there are 10 data items for every worker and every data item is going to take 100 milliseconds. So this should take around one second to run if my calculations are correct and it does indeed take around one second. Now what's interesting about this, although it is not, shouldn't be too surprising, is that if I increase the number of workers, all right, I double the amount of workers, which is much more than I have on my system in terms of logical processors, the time went down by half. Now, if this were, you know, your typical compute workload, I would expect that doubling again should give me basically no improvement. I have now completely swamped the system, but no, it's again you know, pretty close to twice as fast. Let's go up to 128 workers. Now, the number of workers is actually so much bigger than the data sets, or almost the size of the data set, so we're not getting much improvement here, but let's go data set size of 1280. So again, now we're 10 xing. It takes about one second again. So I think it's very clear the point I'm trying to make here is that the, the rule of thumb that applies for your compute workloads, where you want to keep the number of workers about the same as the number of logical processors, that does not apply to asynchronous tasks. You want to fire off as many of those as possible because the faster you fire them off, the faster the results are going to come in. And so now we've got like a little bit of tension going on in here because imagine now we've got a, a, a queue a thread pool here and we're trying to figure out okay how many workers should we put in this queue and we have got a workload where some of the work items are asynchronous and some of the work items are compute and so how many workers should we put in there it's, it's not clear we know that some of them some portion of the tasks that are going to be you know in flight at any given time are going to be asynchronous so we could probably get away with more than 16 but how much more like if we set it to 32 Maybe that's good usually, but what if we happen to, just by happenstance, we get 32 concurrent tasks in flight at once. Now we've oversubscribed our CPU and the system is going to shit the bed. That's a technical term. So the problem we face here is essentially one of conflicting requirements, right? We would like a large number of workers when we're dealing with asynchronous tasks, since you know we can keep them all in flight. Uh, but when we're dealing with compute tasks, then we want a limited number of workers so we don't overwhelm our system. And the solution to this problem, it becomes pretty obvious and pretty elegant once you realize that you're dealing with separate concerns here. So you separate the concern 
of handling asynchronous tasks with the concern of handling compute tasks by separating your pool of workers into two different pools. And then when you get compute tasks, you submit them to the compute pool. And when you get asynchronous tasks, you submit them to the async pool. Now you can give your async queue a ton of workers. You can keep many requests in flight and don't get constipated just waiting for something to happen. Uh, but you can also limit the amount of actual compute tasks you have in flight at once so that you don't grind the system responsiveness to a halt. Simultaneously, you solve the problem of oversubscription and constipation by separating the concerns. Now, that solution is very amazing and satisfying in the case where you have tasks that are all 100% async or 100% compute. But what you often get is tasks that are mixed. And suddenly, again, we have a problem. Because like think think about a very simple task. You know, you're gonna you're gonna download a file from a URL and then you're gonna process that file. So part of the task is just waiting for the response from the server, for the transfer to complete over the network, so that you can access the bytes of the file. And then the other half of the task is going to be actually processing the file using the CPU. So if we set up a basic, you know, system here where it takes about hundred milliseconds to get the file and that's all asynchronous work, and then 100 milliseconds to process the file, and that is all using up a single core. Now we're back to square one, because we're like, well, this task, they don't really belong in an asynchronous pool or a compute pool, because they got a little bit of both. And if you put them all, if we go back to our system, we say, okay, we're just gonna have one pool, it's gonna be a very bad situation, because like, you're gonna start these tasks, and you're gonna, all your threads are gonna start on a task, and they're all just gonna be waiting, so you're gonna be using 0% of the CPU, for 100 milliseconds, and then you're going to hammer the CPU for 100 milliseconds, and then you're going to go back to using 0%. You're only using 50% of the potential of your compute, and you're probably not keeping as many, you know, network requests in flight as you would like either. So it's just a really bad situation all around. Now, I mean, you might ask, well, why not just separate this out into two like separate tasks? One asynchronous, and then one compute, and then submit them to separate queues. But the problem is, is that the result of this operation is needed in order to begin this operation. So you can't just completely separate it. There's a dependency there. Uh, so we want to like basically block on the asynchronous and then when it's complete, start the compute one. And the good news is we can do this. We just get, we need a few rules. So rule number one, very simple. 100% asynchronous tasks go into the async queue and 100% compute tasks go into the compute queue. The same as before. Uh, rule number two, if a task is mixed, asynchronous and compute, we create an asynchronous task for the whole process. And rule number three, any asynchronous task cannot do compute work. It can only wait on the asynchronous result of some other operation. So if we find ourselves with an asynchronous task that contains compute work, we make this task create a subtask and submit that subtask to the compute queue and then it will block on that task and this task will only exit when this compute task has finished. So there's the secret sauce. We have to add the ability for our tasks, specifically our asynchronous tasks, to submit other tasks to the compute queue. The asynchronous task can call an asynchronous operation directly within its body but if it finds it that it needs to do some processing, it has to create a compute task for that and submit it to the queue and then wait on that. All right, so we need two things here. First, we need to separate our thread pools. We need two thread pools, and we need the ability for our tasks to submit subtasks to a thread pool. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna make a singleton that contains our two thread pools and make some static functions to submit the two kinds of tasks that we will support. All right, I created this exec class, it's singleton concept. It has async pool and compute pool. You can initialize it, give you the number of async and compute workers, and then you can call these static functions async and compute, and they will call run on the corresponding pool. So I initialize that with the stuff from the CLI. I also change worker count to async count and compute count. So differentiate those. And now in main here, instead of creating my pool, that's already in the singleton, I just use exec async on the code we were having there before. Now, 
Let's implement one of these composite tasks that is going to submit a subtask. So the asynchronous wrapper task is going to take in reference to the work item. This is the compute work that needs to be done. And we're basically just simulating the idea of, you know, doing a web request and then doing work on that. Although we're not directly doing a request, obviously. Async task, that's the asynchronous blocking part of it. And then after that, we need to execute the compute task. So what we're going to do is we're going to go exec compute with a compute task working on the work item. And we need to block on this. So this is going to return a future. We need to block on this because we don't want the entire task complete until the entire task is complete. So this is already blocking. We make sure that we block on this one. And now this wrapper async is going to have a future that represents completion of the entire task, the asynchronous part and the compute part. Now there's one problem here, this call to uh, exec async. This lambda is expecting a work item, but we're not passing in anything in here. We could forward the work item, but we could also what we could also do is instead of passing it in as a parameter, we could just use it as a bind. So we could bind the work item like that. That works fine. All right, now let's try to build it. Okay, the combine takes no time at all. Let's give ourselves a lot of compute and a lot of async. And we'll increase our data set by a ton here. And now, if we had limited our thread pool to only 16 workers, 100 milliseconds, this would take many seconds to complete. But because we have our huge async pool working, only it could be done in one second. In fact, I mean, since async is basically free, if we increase this, yeah, we pretty much double the speed. But we are not oversubscribing our resources because none of those async threads are really doing any work. They're just sleeping. See, now if I beef up the compute workload, it takes one second, but system is fine. There's no problem with responsiveness. And there you have it. You can now handle heterogeneous tasks that have an asynchronous component and a compute component by decomposing and separating out the compute into their own tasks that also get submitted to a queue. And this is obviously a very simplistic flow, but you can imagine like much more complex flows where you might, one task, let me just draw it out here, might actually have to launch like four asynchronous operations and then join those together to do like a compute on them, which might fork into multiple more asynchronous and perhaps more compute. And so you could have tasks and subtasks within subtasks and stuff like that. You could do a lot of crazy stuff. So this is a very interesting approach. It's not the main approach. And I will be looking at the, uh, the other approaches to this problem. Uh, but uh, there, is, there is actually a little wrinkle that I ran into composing more complex uh, asynchronous tasks and subtasks. So I think I want to talk about that in the next video. And uh, that, that will allow us to explore another interesting idea in this uh, task execution queue pool sort of thing. But I'm a little excited for the future of this series because I don't know if you realize, but these things are all linked into a bigger picture. Like there are things coming into this, the standard library like executors and uh, networking that are very closely linked to this. And this stuff is very closely intertwined with the concepts in, for example, Boost ASIO. Uh, which is another thing I kind of want to talk about in this video, along with ideas of coroutines. So it's all kind of linked together in this series, and uh, I, I think it'll be fun to explore all these different aspects and kind of like weave it all together into a, a larger understanding of the big picture. But that'll do it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you're excited, as excited as I am for the future. If so, click the like button. Helps a lot, and I will see you again with some more C++ multi-threading.